Welcome to WordPath, a show about Oklahoma Indian languages and the people who are teaching and preserving them. Before we begin tonight's show, I'd like to give an update on our Boomer Sooner contest. Uh, we've had this contest going for a few months, and we have not been getting very many entries. So uh, we have upped the prize money a little bit and extended the deadline. The prize money uh, offered now is $45. Thanks very much to Shirley McCullough on camera one, who has contributed some, and also Molly Levite at the uh, Levite of Apache store in Norman has added some to sweeten the pot. Um, so if you win this contest, you can come on the, song, on the show and sing your song, and you'll have $45 uh, to take your sweetheart, sweetheart out to dinner and celebrate. The deadline is now August the 1st, um, and entries should be sent to Post Office Box 2872, Norman, Oklahoma, 73070. To recap the basic contest one more time, uh, you know there's this Boomer Sooner fight song that, uh, OU that is it's sung in support of OU teams. Um, it's named after Boomers who were coming to take the land from Indian Territory and Sooners who wouldn't even wait for the legal uh, gunshot to cross the border, <laughs> which is uh, a little questionable in terms of uh, respect for Indian people, I think. So I thought it would be good to have an alternate verse to the song, which would, be, uh, which would have words in an Indian language of Oklahoma. So anyone, any resident of Oklahoma can enter this contest. Uh, the, they need to submit at least one verse of the song on a tape and in writing and then a translation of it and tell us what language it is because our judges will check for authenticity. Uh, and we'll take the best, uh, the best entry and have you come on the show and give you the prize money and who knows, maybe it'll catch on. Maybe it won't, but I think it would be a fun, fun thing to do. Uh, complete written rules are available at various local um, Indian art and gift supply venues like Tribes Gallery, Levite of Apache, uh, the Windmill Store, and the Jacobson Foundation. All right, now for tonight's show, this is part two of our show about um, language teaching myths and methods. This is sort of how do, how do you teach an Indian language, or if you want to be a student, what, what are some tips for helping you to learn it? The overall problem, as we said in part one, is that the natural chain of transmission has been broken uh, so that that teaching of the parents, teaching their children who teach their children who teach their children, that's been interrupted for various reasons that we talked about. So now we have to have teachers who will specifically teach the language, uh, and students must specifically study the language um, if they're going to ever become fluent. Uh, we need to reconnect the elders with the very young. That's the overall uh, issue here. Now, um, if Prabhat, if you in the booth could put up that first page of uh, of uh, titles there. I'll go over, uh, repeat some of the main um, overall principles of language teaching. Uh, number one, you need to have a fluent role model for your students. You need to have, uh, two, you need to have clear input, that is clear in that they can hear it well, of course, but also clear in that there's no ambiguity. It's, the context is very strong so the students can sort of tell what's being talked about without even having to have a translation as much as possible. Three, you need to have frequent input. Your classes should meet two to five times per week, if possible. It's not always possible, but it's much better if you can have more frequent input. Uh, next, you need to have uh, uh, motivation in the classroom. Uh, you don't want your students to be passive and sitting there just sort of passively taking in what you say. You want them to be involved. So you want to use communicative, participatory kind of methods as much as possible. You want to make it fun, and you want it to be relevant to the students' lives. And finally, you want to use the language together. Don't just talk about the language. Talk to each other in the language. Uh, and of course, do this in a culturally appropriate way. Bring in language, bring language and culture together whenever possible. So language is not just vocabulary. It's the whole package of how you use it and what you do when you're talking the language. Um, we briefly talked about some specific language teaching methods and theories. Um, but I think these are the overall the most important uh, things to remember. Uh, we also briefly talked about the issue of children and adults. Do they learn differently? And we said, yes, in fact, they do. Our brains actually change as we mature physically. And so children are really more gifted for language learning than adults are. And yet it's important to remember, too, I think, that a lot of the difference in how we are in language learning is a social difference. Adults get much more hung up and self-conscious and embarrassed about, about not speaking a language well. And children don't mind acting silly or making a mistake, they just jump right in and do it. So one of the morals there is, even if you're an adult, you must become as a child if you really want to learn to speak a language and learn it quickly. Uh, you need to really throw yourself into it and let go of all of your hang-ups. <laughs> um, so, and I, I think it's also good, even though you may want to have separate classes for children and adults, have some activities where the children and adults can be learning together, which is more sort of mimics the natural language situation anyway. Um, 
Okay, then we started, we talked mostly last time about tips for language teachers. Um, I think uh, you could go ahead and bring up the next page for bot of tips. Yeah, uh, major factors, let's see, I may have gotten off my uh, schedule here. Well, we'll work it all in. Uh, let, me, let me just talk up to this a little bit. Uh, first of all, teachers should always be friendly, cheerful, positive, never uptight, uh, use a relaxed and varied approach in the classroom. It'll make everything go so much more smoothly. So here we are now at some of the major factors for learning. Uh, they are uh, relaxation, participation, a feeling of safety, a sense of fun, a sense of accomplishment. All of these are very important factors in language learning. Uh, in other words, these are things that the students have to be feeling. If they're not feeling that, they're going to be all, I can't do this. But if they are relaxed and participating and they feel safe, uh, and that they're not going to be made fun of, nothing bad is going to happen to them, then, then they will actually learn better. Uh, so try to, as a teacher, try to take the pressure off of the situation as much as possible. Um, and uh, use activities that will be fun, even for those students who may be sort of discouraged about their progress. If you can get them just engaged in what's going on, they'll start to lose that discouragement and, and they'll actually start to learn better. Um, one of the things that is not such a big factor in language learning, uh, and this will surprise some people, is intelligence. Uh, if you think about it, everyone learns their first language. I'm talking about a range of normal intelligence from sort of slow people to brilliant geniuses. We all learn our first language or languages at about the same rate. So it seems like our natural gifts for language learning don't vary that much with a specific IQ or anything like that. It's more the social factors and the atmosphere in the classroom, I think, that are more important. Uh, now, um, let's go to the third page, Prabhat, for bring up the next one. We'll start talking about some more specific suggestions for language teaching. Uh, we already said uh, be friendly, cheerful, and positive. And another thing is to use demonstrations and miming and acting out as much as possible. I'm going to give you just a little tiny bit of a demo here. We're not in an actual classroom, so I don't have students to respond to me, but I'll try to give you an idea of something that I've used in a Comanche language classroom pretty successfully. Uh, everybody likes to learn in their beginning classes how to count. Let's keep it simple, and we'll just talk about the numbers 1 through 5 for now. Suppose I wanted to give a, a lesson in the numbers 1 through 5. Well, I could hand out a sheet and say, this is the word for 1 in Comanche, this is the word for 2, this is the word for 3. And we could talk about it a lot in English, and they could look at their paper and study it, and they could hear me pronounce the words and maybe repeat them. This is the typical sort of thing you see in the language classroom. But we really don't need to depend that much on the writing or on talking about the language in English. We can actually jump right in and, following one of our uh, overall guidelines, use the language rather than talking about it. And don't be passive, but be communicative. Use it for a purpose. Talk to each other in the classroom. And here's how I could do it. As a t teacher, I could just take out some objects. I've got pencils here because they're easy to handle. Um, and I could just start counting. And I might say, first of all, I'm going to have to talk about this a little bit to our audience so that you'll know what I'm trying to demonstrate. But in the classroom, uh, just cut out the English. The, the English will not have to be used in the classroom. I might begin my lesson by taking out the pencils and saying, Summer, Wahat, Bahit, Hayeroquet, Moovet, Tasa. Summer, Wahat, Pahit, Hayaroquet, Moovet, Hipetasita, Moovet ma, Hipetasita, Hayaroquet ma, Hipetasita, Wahat ma, Summer, Wahat, Wahat ma. And of course, if we were in a real classroom at appropriate intervals, I would ask uh, each of the students to, do, to take a turn doing this after they've heard me go through it a few times and we've pronounced all the numbers together. And you can get people, you don't even have to tell people in English, let's say it together. You can just start off, summa, wahat. And then just gesture to the class and say, summa, hipetasita, summa, summa, summa. Look at each student until you see that each one is saying it with you. Then you go, ha, huh, summa, wahat. And they will say, wahat, with you. And you wait until everyone's doing it. And you watch out for anyone who's sitting back and being lazy and not participating. And you make sure that they, uh, 
you call on them individually, they'll be so embarrassed, they'll make sure they'll participate from then on. <laughs> so you get through the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. They've heard all the numbers for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. They've all practiced it. You've listened and monitored. You're satisfied. They're pronouncing them pretty well. And then you can go into that question and answer deal that I was just starting to do. Hipetisita. Summa. How many is this? This is one. And then you can play this game with the various students, calling on them, asking each one of them, how many is this? How many is this? And so forth. And then uh, this might take you 20 minutes to go through that if you have a reasonable sized class. And then we can go and do addition and subtraction very easily after this. You can say, let's just review. Summa. Wahat. Pahit. Ayaroquet. Mobet. Mobet. Summa ya. Okay. So I'm saying basically five take away one, three take away two, and that and so forth. And if you have objects that you're actually manipulating, and if everyone can see them clearly, and if you make it very abundantly, redundantly clear what you're doing, they'll catch on that you're saying 5 minus 1 or whatever, and they'll be able to do it too. And you can do the same with addition. Uh, as usual, time is passing faster than I want it to, so I think we'll, we'll stick with that one little demonstration to try to give an idea of how you can simply do something and talk about it slowly and clearly with a lot of repetition, and demonstration and context, and people will know what's going on. You don't have to tell them in English, now we're having a lesson in numbers. It's going to be so obvious that the English would really be an unnecessary intrusion in your classroom, and you won't need it. Um, and of course, you can do this with names for animals and all sorts of other basic vocabulary if you have flashcards with pictures and things like that, or actual animals or stuffed animals or something like that. And you can do it with any, any area of the vocabulary you want to, pretty much. Um, uh, some other specific things for teachers, though. Let's get down through this list a little bit more. Um, don't be afraid to act silly. That's a, a good tip for the students and the teachers. But in order to act out in mime and make things abundantly clear, you may have to smile really big and jump up and down and be just uh, kind of a, everything should be exaggerated because that way people will really get the idea a lot better. Um, make the classroom like life. You might want to eat or drink or dance or move around and do various things, or manipulate objects, or draw pictures, and things like that. Don't, what you want to avoid is students just sitting there with their notebooks writing. Because it's very artificial, and it's not very much like life, and it's going to be harder for them to make the connection in their language. Um, a very important principle, talk to the students whenever you can. Just talk as much as possible. You want to simplify your speech, of course, but if you stub your toe, say ouch in the language that you're teaching. If you're hungry, say I'm hungry and just make a silly gesture to make it obvious what you're saying and, and pronounce that in the language. If you pick something up, you can just say, oh, that's heavy in the language. You know, it's redundant, it's unnecessary, it's what you might not do in ordinary life, but you're going to go overboard because you want to be talking as much as possible in such a way that the students will understand what you're saying. But do simplify. Um, we talked last time, uh, for about if you could put up the next page, we went through some basic vocabulary that will get you off to a good start in the classroom. Hello, help me, again, or repeat. That's good, that's not good, or that's wrong. Uh, now you, meaning your turn. Thanks, yes, no. Basic vocabulary like that. We have 13 suggestions on the screen. If you can teach your students that in the first class or two, and just never say those things in English, always say them in the language. That will help set the tone, I think, for using the language as much as possible. Because you'd be surprised how much of the chit-chat in the classroom is just those 13 expressions. And you can, get, you can really get a long way with that. Um, always go for understandability and consistency, not necessarily perfection. If someone isn't pronouncing something just right, instead of saying, ha, huh, you said sima, not sima, no, recognize that they're trying to say one and say, ha, huh, summa, and then repeat it with the correct pronunciation and try to get them re to refine their pronunciation a little bit, but always doing a positive kind of reinforcement, so to speak. Uh, don't jump on the little errors, but always reward the big successes, even the small successes. When a student says a single word, like maybe they don't know how to ask for something, but they know the name of it, but they don't know how to make a sentence asking for it, they might say, uh, sorry, because they want a picture of the dog. And then you could say, oh, and then you would say, yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh. give them good feedback for having gotten the word right, but then expand on their sentence. Fill it in for them so they know, know how to uh, say it in a fuller way. We can go to the next page for bot, I think that item's on there. Expanding on your students' utterances, it'll help them. So if they just say, sorry, you would say, huh, huh, sorry, no, sorry, no, utu. In other words, you're telling them how to say, give me the dog, not just dog. 
dog will work, but you want them gradually to expand on their ability to put actual sentences together. We talked before about using repetition. Of course, use repetition a lot. It's always very important in language learning, but use it with some variation, not just the same word over and over again, but a little variation. So if you were um, talking about colors, uh, you could say, um, where are we? So-and-so's shirt is red in the language. Uh, you could say that 18 times, but it'd be better to say that like two times and then say so-and-so's shirt is green, so-and-so's shirt is blue. So you're repeating the pattern, but with a word changing each time and they'll catch on what that changing word is that you're talking about the different colors and yet you're repeating the overall sentence pattern so they'll find it easier next time they want to say what color something is, how to do it, and they just need to fill in the appropriate color. Um, have students repeat words the, the first time they hear them to make sure that they're hearing them correctly. I think that's important. Um, and also students will get the most out of repetition if it's meaningful to them, if it's part of a game that they're playing, maybe a competition. Uh, or some kind of performance that they're being graded on or something like that. So try to integrate things so that they actually are, be, are useful to the students. And use your sentence patterns, as I just suggested. Varying something a little bit, the same sentence with, with just one or two words change can help to teach them a grammatical rule without making it a rule. Maybe we should um, go on to the tips for students, the next page. Um, Number one, respect your teacher. Don't quibble about their uh, particular dialect or choice of words or something in the classroom. They must be the sole authority. Don't waste your time bickering over the details or different ways of saying things. Always listen carefully. And another thing people sometimes forget, don't only listen, but also watch. If you watch your teacher's mouth and lips and tongue, you might pick up on a sound that your ear has missed. And it might help you realize how to shape your own mouth in order to pronounce it correctly. Always participate. Don't ever let yourself just sit there and be shy and passive. Um, whenever you do something or feel something or have a reaction, don't keep it to yourself. Don't, don't inwardly comment. Always say something, even though you have to make it very simple. Like instead, if you can't say, could you repeat that again, please? But you know from your basic vocabulary list the word for again, you could just say, if it were a Comanche class, das, again. And that will accomplish what you want. So take whatever little bit you know and use it as much as possible. And use that basic vocabulary. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. This is how you learn. This is how we all learn to speak English or whatever our first language was. Always practice. If you have language tapes, and hopefully you will, uh, use your tapes every day. Even if you only have class once a week, it's all the more important to put that tape on so that you hear that input, clear input of a native speaker as often as possible. And there are lots of other little tricks you can do. Um, you can put labels on your objects with the, uh, say if it were Comanche again, uh, you could put the Comanche word for table on a little sticker and put it on here and the word for chair here and plant here. It might seem silly, but if you label the things in your home, you're bringing that language into your own life. It's not only in the classroom now, but it's in your life as well. And when you learn, say, kinship terms, think about, uh, in Comanche, it was hard for me to remember elder sister versus younger sister until I thought, well, I only have a, an elder sister, so I have... Uh, my sister Donna is Nepatsi, so I would think Patsi Donna, Patsi Donna, and I never got the two confused again because I had personalized the language so that it meant something to me. Um, I'm trying to rush along here because we have a nice treat here for the end of the program. Um, we can take those titles down, I think, Prabhat, and get that uh, Hawaiian tape ready. Let me introduce it a little bit while you're getting it ready to run. This runs a, a little over nine minutes. Um, <clears throat> this show really does focus on the Native American languages of Oklahoma. Uh, but there are other uh, Native American languages, of course. And the reason I want to bring in this outside language this time of Hawaiian is because the, there's this tape available that's very inspirational. And the history of the Hawaiian language is very inspirational. And it's a good um, example of the kind of immersion method of language teaching that we were talking about in part one of this show, where you, you use English, for our purposes, use English as little as possible. And the language of instruction is the language that you're trying to teach. So in the, this uh, Hawaiian classroom that we're going to see, you won't hear a word of English. The teachers always speak Hawaiian. The children always speak Hawaiian. The children speak Hawaiian to each other. They use it to get what they want. They use it to react to something. They sing together only in Hawaiian. They tell stories in Hawaiian and so forth. Um, about 20 years ago, the Hawaiian language was in a very similar situation to a lot of Oklahoma Indian languages today. That I've got, uh, I don't have a reliable uh, estimate of the exact number of speakers there were. I've read figures anywhere from 250 fluent speakers up to a few thousand. A few hundred or a few thousand out of a population who consider themselves native Hawaiian people of about 111,000. So it was a very small percentage of Hawaiians that still spoke their ancestral language. And a lot of people were saying, it's too late. Uh, let's take a look at this tape and we'll see what's happened happening in the last 20 years and we'll see how much things have changed.
ke ho'o mau ia nei ka olelo makuahine, makahana ana kupuna, ana makua, amena keki mana kula, amena home. Ke komo a nei kaku ina kula ho'o na awa olelo oivi, e a'o aku ma o ka olelo Hawaii vale no. Maia mau kula, oia ho'i o na punana leo, amena kula kaya puni Hawaii, e maalama ia ai ka olelo Hawaii. He hana kūpono no kēia e ho olai i ka olelo. He mea nui kēia ia kākou no ka mea i nā makemake kākou e ola ka olelo Hawaii. Pono e ola mana kēiki Hawaii. O ke ki ina a o maia mau kula, O ka olelo Hawaii vale no ke olelo ia. Helu helu ia, a kākau ia e nā kumu a me nā haumāna a pau. I ka lohe mau ana a me ka olelo mau no, e maana nā keiki i ka olelo i ka vae a oai i nā haavina like ole. Ma ka puke, ma ka pepe iau, ma ka waha a ma ka nā au no hoi o nā kamali'i e ola nei ka olelo o iwi. Kau maka anak kula ano awal nak kiki maka kau ikolah lawai kikai o maka kau awal awal kenui olah aku aku menai ho makai ano hana nui no maki awal ane alaku kau wa wa apa no laku inala apa we oleh lawai oleh lawai ano ke awal ana Aku oleh lo vale no eh oleh lo yang Allah laku aku opini main amal dia laku yang makau kau ini. Eh, aku kau mahin nak aku oleh no makau kau lo itu. Kalau aku mahin nak eh aku ikut. Aku laku ke mau pupuk kau laku inu aku makai ikut. Aku kalau mahin nak anu makau kau. Kau mereka mahin nak eh ha makau kau lo. Aga kapa, e ia no ka vika, ka ike a ona kua pa, e ia no ka vika. Hiki i nga keiki mai ka makahiki e kolu a i e lima, ke komo mai i loko o nga kula ka maiki punana leo. I ka hemo ana o nga keiki mai ka punana leo, e ho o mau no lako me ke kahi mau keiki e ae, ma nga kula haa haa mai ka papa malao a hiki i ka papa e ono. Aya na puna na leo a me na kula kaya puni Hawaii, ma Kauai, o Ahu, Maui, a me Hawaii. A e ho'o nui ia ea na na kula ma na wahi ea e ke kahi. Hana na keiki i na mea like ole he kupono no ko lako nui, a ma ka olelo Hawaii vale no keia mau hana. I kau mana o? He mea mai ka ilo a kia kula. Kholo an kula Hawaii. Nui kau make make ao ina kamali ili ili. Ho iki ala kau kame Hawaii ao i mau kupuai. Kame ai ao ia mai ai ya. Hau oli wau ka ka ao ana ina iki mau keki i kahula ana kahime ni ana ke kakau ana. Olelo ana apela aku nui no nama aku i makai makai ayah awi kia mau keki makia kula. Hey no no, kafika halo kuapo nui ko no no pilihan na ika am. Nah awina kai mau ha awina hoi hoi paha kai ha awina ho no na keki. Papa oi kule. O hiki no nga kupo na ke ho iki kia mo kamali i ko lakou o nela. Ua hiki no ya lakou ke helu helu i ka o lana Hawaii, a mao popo i ka o lana Hawaii. Me ka himeni ana, me ka hula ana. Laki no kia mo ke iki kamali i. No ka mea o hiki no ya lakou ke o lelo a mao popo i ka lakou o lelo. I na lohe no ka hi mo mele, o a mao popo ne kia mo mele. Vee kena mao lima. Aai. 
Ke Hela poli a me hu i hu i keia. E hele ana au i ko u tutu hal. Ua hele au e ike i na holo holo. Ma keia papa kaya puni hawa i nei. Kea o nei na keiki i na haavina like o nei. E like me ka make makika, ka makau o lelo, ka pili kanaka, ma o ka o lelo hawa i. Pela pu me ka ike hawa i. Na mele, na hula, na oli, na moolelo, a me na loina o kokako poe. Ka i ka o kohana. He mea nui loa ke a o aku ina keiki i ka ike Hawaii. I mea e ikai ka ai ko lakou na au, a i loa ai ke ka hua paa e kuwai. He Hawaii au, malo. Wasn't that a terrific tape? That illustrates what's called the uh, famous Bunanaleo uh, or language nest, language immersion type of uh, approach to Hawaiian language preservation. And I think we, can, we would do well to do something very similar in Oklahoma in so many languages. Uh, notice what this shows. It shows that children are up to it. Children are smart enough to learn by immersion. Uh, it shows the advantage of bringing in the kupuna, in this case, in other words, the elders. Um, and it shows how language and culture can be uh, combined in the classroom. It showed how important it is to make it fun. Remember when that teacher was showing them the vowels and she was going, ah, ee. She wasn't afraid to be silly and she was really engaging and the children really wanted to do it along with her. She was hamming it up and they used music a lot and culture uh, and they did a lot of things together and the children were highly motivated and none of them were passive. That's really the way to do it. So let's hope we can do something like that in Oklahoma in the near future. See you next time on WordPath. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gona kita, wa pene ma da oni kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gona kita, wa pene ma da oni kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gona kita, wa pene ma da oni kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gona kita, wa pene ma da oni kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gona kita, wa pene ma da oni kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gona kita, wa pene ma da oni kita.